Okay, we're back and we are now on passage four. We know passage four is always either social science or global conversation. We've already had our social science. And if we look at this, this was written in 1900, so we know it's our global conversation. It is also a paired passage, so that is going to be important. If you remember on the paired passage, the first thing we do is we read this information right here. It's going to give us information about the relationship between the passages, and the titles will often also give us some information. So passage one is adapted from a speech delivered in 1898 by Albert, uh, Albert Beveridge. Um, Beveridge? No, Beveridge. Um, March of the Flag. Passage two is adapted from a speech delivered in 1900 by William Jennings Bryan called Imperialism. So we will um, diagnose the questions for passage one first, and then read passage one and answer those questions, um, summarize passage one in our heads, and then move on to passage two. So in uh, question number 33, in passage one, Beveridge asserts, that's another word for says, so it's a content and characterization question, and it does not have a follow-up. So he asserts that the resources and immensity of the United States is something. So something about the resources and size of the U.S. Uh, in the second paragraph, uh, the commands mainly serve two. So this is going to be a purpose function. Lines 26 through 41, so that's kind of a big fella. And these are commands. Why is he using these commands might be a question that we would ask. Um, the next question is about line 72. Line 72 is part of passage two, so we're not quite there yet. Let's, let's stop. So we're going to talk about the resources and immensity of the United States. And then we're going to ask ourselves uh, what the purpose of all these commands in paragraph two is. So let's take a read. Fellow citizens, it is a noble land that God has given us. Okay, that's important. Uh, a land that can feed and clothe the world. So not just ourselves, but everyone. A land whose coastlines would enclose half the countries of Europe. So that's uh, the immensity, the largeness. A land set like a sentinel. A uh, sentinel's job is to watch over between the two oceans. A greater England with a nobler destiny, so better than England. It is a mighty people, we're so strong, that he, so remember capital he references back to God, that he has planted on the soil, a people sprung from the most masterful blood of history, a people perpetually revitalized by the virile working folk of the earth, a people imperial, so like empire-like, by virtue of their power, by right of their institutions, by authority of their heaven-directed purposes, so that goes back to God as well, uh, the propagandist and not the misers of liberty. So we, we um, promote liberty. We do not squander it away. It is a glorious history. Our gods, so that's God for the fourth time, has bestowed upon his chosen people. Ooh, he chose us. We are fancy. A history whose keynote was struck by the Liberty Bell, a heroic history with faith in our mission and our future, a history of statesmen who flung the boundaries of the Republic out into unexplored lands, a history of soldiers who carried the flag across blazing deserts and through the rank of hostile mountains, even to the gates of sunset. A history of multiplying people who overran a continent in half a century. The history divinely logical, ooh, divinely, that's important. Um, in the process of whose tremendous reasoning we find ourselves today. Okay, so we are big, we are powerful, God gave us all this stuff. Um, good, good things. Um, think of the thousands of Americans who will pour into... Hawaii, and Puerto Rico when the Republic's laws cover those islands with justice. So this is the first command is to think about these people. Think of the tens of thousands of Americans who will invade the Philippines when the liberal government shall establish order and equity there. So again, think about what's going to happen when we establish order in these foreign lands. Think of the hundreds of thousands of Americans who will build a civilization in, of energy and industry in Cuba when a government of law replaces the double reign of anarchy. So that's replacing a good thing with a bad thing again. Um, think of the prosperous, so that's a good thing, millions that empress of islands will support when, obedient to the law of political gravitation, her people ask for the highest honor liberty can bestow, the sacred order of the stars and stripes. Okay, so it looks like he is commanding us to think of all the good things that will happen when we go take over these other areas. Um, so let's look at the first question. Um, he asserts the resources and immensity of the United States constitute a safeguard against foreign invasion. There's not really any foreign invasion here. The only foreign entity discussed at all is England, and it says that we're better than England. Um, replication of the conditions in Europe. So again, we're not, um, we're not replicating them or repeating them um, or copying them. It actually says that we are better than England and bigger than Europe as a whole. 
Uh, divine gift to the American people. Okay, so this idea of divine gift means from God, and he is mentioned a lot here. And it even says um, heaven-directed purposes, which is also divine. So that could be it. Sources of envy for people in other countries. In that paragraph, again, there aren't necessarily people of other country mentioned. So he's just asserting that all these things come from God. Okay, number 34. In the second paragraph, all these commands, think of all these good things that are going to happen. Um, mainly serve to remind the audience of its civic responsibilities. That one is not clearly wrong, but let's come back and talk about it. Um, anticipate the benefits of a proposed policy. Okay, there were a lot of benefits because it's the law covers those islands with justice, um, establish order and equity, civilization of energy and industry. So that could be it. Emphasize the urgency of a national problem. It's not necessarily a national problem. It looks like we are going to, quote unquote, fix problems in other nations. So that would not be correct. Refute arguments that opponents have advanced. They don't really assert an argument or a refutation, so we can't go with D. So let's look at A versus B. Is it our civic responsibility or are there just possible benefits of a, of a proposed policy? It never says we as Americans have to do this or, um, you know, and all this stuff about, you know, God giving us these things, that does not translate into we have a responsibility to others. So I think that is too detailed and not supported by the passage. So we have to go with B. Think about all the good things that are going to happen if we do go into um, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, all these other areas. All right, so let's look at the second passage. Um, overall, it looks like the first one, um, the first passage was about the grandness of America and all the great things that will happen if we take these ideas of liberty into other areas. So let's see what passage two is going to say. We know based on global conversation paired passages that they are usually going to be in opposition of one another. So if passage one is talking about all the good things that will happen when we go to other countries, passage two is probably going to take an oppositional look. Um, question 35 first is a word in context though. So let's look at line, whoop, let's look at line, there we go, 72 and the word recalled. So we'll stop there and try to find a word that has that same intention or effect. And then 36, it can reasonably, reasonably be inferred. So we know that's an inference question. And it has a COE follow-up. So I'm just going to mark this. Now, this is kind of important to notice. What do you do when the COE follow-up is not directly below? You need to make sure that you're leaving yourself some very obvious uh, demarcations so that you don't answer these out of order. I like to do this arrow down and then this arrow up. Uh, some people like to go from here to here. It's just whatever is easiest for your eye. But make sure that you are doing something that is very obvious to your eye on test day. Um, you might even note, note under here that there is a COE after. Ooh, I don't know why I have four lines on that. Learning the alphabet at the age of 36. Let's try this E again. We all make mistakes, guys. It's a Bob Ross moment. Okay, um, as used in line 58, so we have another word in context. 58, and we're going to look at the word calculate. I'm sorry, 85. I don't know what I just did there. My apologies. Okay, so 85, the word calculate. And then the last question for this passage, it looks like, let's see. Oop. Is, yeah, so this is the last one for just passage 2. Oh, no, that is for both of them. So we are going to stop there and just answer these four questions. So two words in context and then a COE pair. So we don't have to keep anything in the back of our head as we read. We can just read and kind of make notes. Okay. If it is right for the United States to hold the Philippine Islands permanently and imitate European empires and the government of colonies, the Republican Party ought to stay its position and defend it. But it must expect the subject race, so the uh, Philippines in this, in this situation, to protest against such a policy and to resist the extent to the extent of their ability. The Filipinos do not need any encouragement from Americans now living. Our whole history has been an encouragement not only to the Filipino, but to all who are denied a voice in their own government. If the Republicans are prepared to censure all who have used language calculated to make the Filipinos hate foreign uh, domination, then let them condemn the speech of Patrick Henry. Okay, so Patrick Henry is a big guy in American history. When he uttered the passionate appeal, give me liberty or give me death. 
he expressed a sentiment which still echoes in the hearts of, of men. Let them censure Jefferson. So when he's saying let them, the them refers to Republicans. So if Republicans are against Filipinos not wanting to be governed, then they're going against the, the words of Patrick Henry and the words of Jefferson. Of all the state, statesmen of history, none have used words so offensive to those who would hold their fellows in the political bondage. Let them censure Washington, who declared that the colonists must choose between liberty and slavery, slavery, or if the statute of limitations has run against the sins of Henry and Jefferson and Washington, let them censure Lincoln, whose Gettysburg speech will be quoted in defense of popular government when the present advocates of force and conquest are forgotten. So he uses all of these um, historical figures as a way of saying everything that we have built in America stands against us encroaching on the Filipinos' right to self-govern. Uh, someone had said once that, said that a truth once spoken can never be recalled. Um, it goes on and on, and no one can set a limit to its ever-widening influence. So not being able to set an, a limit to the influence makes me think that it continues being influential. So we don't mean recalled here as a remembered word, but as in like a recall on car parts. So we will forever, it, it's out there, you can't take it back. Um, but if it were possible to obliterate every word written or spoken in defense of the principles set forth in the De Declaration of Independence, a war of conquest would still leave its legacy of perpetual hatred, for it was God himself who placed in every human heart the love of liberty. Okay, so he's referencing God's given us our love of, of, love of liberty. He never made a race of people, so he again being God, um, so low in the scale of civilization or intelligence that it would welcome a foreign master. Those who would have this nation enter upon a career of empire must consider not only the effect of imperialism on the Filipino, but they must also calculate its effects upon our own nation. So to me, this kind of seems like a uh, mathematical adding up of or um, taking into account the effects that this imperialism would have on us. We cannot repudiate the principle of self-government in the Philippines without weakening that principle here. Okay. So 72, we talked about the word recalled as being like taken back, like uh, when something is wrong with your car, there's a recall on it, we need to take it back and fix it. So the closest word to that looks like it's going to be retracted. Uh, it can be repeated because it goes on to still be influential. Um, it's not rejected because, again, it's still influential. And it can be remembered, so not remembered would be oppositional as well. All right, so now we have an inference question that has a, an evidence follow-up. And we're looking for um, what Brian considers the preference for national sovereignty over foreign rule. So um, being able to self-govern as opposed to being governed from the outside. So in these lines of evidence, we're going to be looking for concepts of self-governing as opposed to being ruled by uh, other nations. 53 through 56. If the Republicans are prepared to censure all who have used language calculated to make the Filipinos hate foreign dominance, domination, let them condemn the speech of Patrick Henry. All right, so that talks about um, the Filipino not um, speaking out against foreign rule, but it doesn't talk about foreign rule versus domestic in general. So let's get rid of that one. It's a little too specific, but doesn't cover all of our bases. Um, 72 through 73. Oh, sorry, right here. It goes on and on, and no one can set a limit to the ever-widening influence. Okay, so again, that's the truth. It's not about the self-governing, so we can get rid of that one. 79 through 81. He, okay, he being God here, never made a race of people so low in their scale of civilization or intelligence that it would welcome a foreign master. Okay, so that talks about foreign governing, um, so let's hold on to that one. And it's saying that foreign governing is not something that is accepted by anyone because God has never made somebody that unintelligent um, or that low in the world that they would want to be ruled by other peoples. So let's look at D just to make sure, but C is looking pretty good. 82 through 85. Those who would have this nation enter upon a career of empire must consider not only the effects on the Filipino, but also the effects on is effectively what that's saying. Um, so that doesn't talk about wanting one or the other. It just talks about the effects of one versus the other. So that leaves us with C as our answer choice. 
And if you remember that line uh, effectively says, God never made somebody so low or so unintelligent that they would prefer being ruled by another nation. So let's take a look. Um, the preference for national sovereignty over foreign rule is a reaction to the excess of imperial governments in the modern era. No, it said that God gave it to us. It's not a response to history. Sign that the belief in human equality is widespread. Okay, that cannot be proven with that line. Testament to the effect of the foreign policy of the United States. No, because um, this actually says that it's kind of worldwide and God-given. Manifestation of an innate or like just indwelling um, characteristic in humans towards self-rule. So this would be the correct answer. God made us this way. God made us to want self-rule and not uh, to be governed by foreign policy. Now, notice that this is an inference question, and so it didn't clearly say word for word, but what we're asserting is that if no one is low or unintelligent enough to prefer a foreign master, then that means that we are all made in a way that prefers self-rule. Okay, so that's how inference evidence sometimes works. Um, number 38, the word calculate, and so we talked about this meaning like to add up or to consider in kind of an accounting uh, mentality, take under consideration all the effects. Um, and we have calculate right here, or evaluate right here. So that is a possibility. Um, we're not designing the effects. We're taking, uh, we're analyzing the effects in a way. Uh, we're not assuming the effects or multiplying the effects. So it does have to be evaluate. We need to consider how it's affecting us as well as them. Okay, so now we have synthesis questions. They are going to be um, questions that ask us to consider both passages in, in conjunction with one another. We know that the first passage was very pro going into other nations and helping provide them liberty. Uh, the second one was effectively saying by doing so we are denying their liberty. Um, and so these are all inferency in a sense, but we can still diagnose them because sometimes we will have a main idea, sometimes we might have a developmental pattern or a purpose function, and then it looks like on this one we even have a COE, so let's take a look. Um, in developing their respective arguments, Beveridge and Brian both express admiration for. Okay, so um, this one is probably just going to be a, a standard synthesis question where we see something that they agree upon. So both express admiration for an idea. They're going to agree about one little thing. Um, number 40, which choice best describes a central difference between how uh, Beveridge and Brian view the concept of liberty as it is realized in the United States? So this is going to be a difference. So again, just a little syn synthesis question. Um, view the concept of liberty, and we're looking for a difference between the two. Number 41, it can most reasonably be inferred. Okay, so that's a clear inference question. And if you notice, this one has a COE follow-up. So um, we will look at what it is asking as we go to answer it. Okay, number 39. In developing their perspective arguments, Beveridge and Brian both express admiration for uh, the founding and history of the United States. So the first paragraph in general is all the great and expansive things in America. And then in passage two, we talk about, um, we quote some of our founding fathers and how important they were. So A could be a good option. Uh, vibrancy and diversity of American culture. No, um, the diversity in American culture is not mentioned really in any of those. Worldwide history of struggles for independence. Um, there is there is this kind of nod to um, us coming from Europe in the first one, but I don't think that they both have an admiration for the struggle of independence. In fact, passage one is asserting that we need to go into other countries to help them find liberty. Um, idealism that permeates many aspects of American style. So it is just the founding in history of the United States. That is the thing that they both share admiration for. All right, number 40. A difference in how they view the concept of liberty as it exists in the United States. Beveridge presents it as a direct inheritance of European colonization, whereas Brian presents it as a sharp break from earlier governments in Europe. Um, I don't think that would be, um, there's not enough information there to choose that answer. Beveridge considers it so exemplary as to justify conquest of other regions, so liberty is so great that we need to bring it to other people, whereas Brian warns that its exemplary quality would be undermined by imperialism. So 
it's so great that if we take it to other people, that kind of undoes the, the idea of liberty in general. So let's save that one. Beveridge argues that it arose organically as the United States matured, or as Brian argues that it was present from the country's beginning. No, Beveridge kind of asserts that it was there from the beginning. It's what we were founded on and God gave it to us. Beveridge regards it as a model that should be shared with other countries, whereas Brian believes that it is unique to the United States and could not work elsewhere. Okay, uh, first of all, um, it's not that it can't work elsewhere, it's that it's not our job to take it there. So let's get rid of D. And that leaves us with B. Number 41 is our COE follow-up. It can most reasonably be inferred from passage 2 that Brian would criticize the vision of American governance of island territories that passage 1 presents for being what? So a criticism of this governance of island territories. Uh, 42 through 48. If it is right for the United States to hold the Philippine island permanently and imitate European empires and governments and colonies, the Republican Party ought to state its position and defend it, but it must expect that the subject races will protest against such a policy and resist to the extent of their ability. Okay, so if you want to go into the islands, expect the locals to not be accepting of your bringing a liberty or whatever it is you are planning to do. So that is definitely a possibility. Let's hold on to A. 49 through 50. The Filipino do not need any encouragement from Americans uh, now living. Okay, that doesn't really talk of, that doesn't really give us enough information um, regarding uh, the governance of islands. So we can get rid of B. 50 through 53. Our whole history has been an encouragement only to the Philippines, but also to but to all who are denied a voice in their own government. Okay, so that seems to be going against this idea of going in, going in there. So we can get rid of that one. And then 56 through 59. When he uttered his passionate appeal, give me liberty or give me death, he expressed a sentiment which still echoes in the hearts of men. Okay. So that does not deal with us going into the islands and governing. So we can get rid of that one as well. So it looks like the only one that dealt with that concept was A. And what it said is if we go into the islands to govern, we have to expect that the subject races, the Filipinos in this situation, will protest and resist to the extent of their ability. So they will not want us there. Okay. And uh, he sees it as unrealistic since most Americans would be unwilling to relocate. There's nothing discussed about Americans uh, moving, and so we cannot say that they are unwilling. Deceptive since economic domin uh, domination would be the true goal. Okay, there's nothing in that line that can uh, show us economic plans. Um, he would say that it's impractical since the islanders would insist upon an equal distribution of resources. Um, this is not resisting the way that line is implying, so we can get rid of C. Naive, since the islanders would object to being governed by Americans. Yes, so resist, protest, object, all those words balance with one another. So that is number 41, and that is the end of passage 4. Okay, so now we're on the last passage. Uh, it's a natural science, as, the pa as passage 5 always is. And if you look, let's see, if you look, this has a graph. So if you're going to eject chord one, this might be a good one to do. Um, let's take a look at the answers and get them diagnosed first. Okay, according to the passage, that is a content characterization. It does not have a COE follow-up, so we're looking for something about exposure to light and what it does for the seeds. So when seeds are exposed to light, what happens? Um, if you're eject chording this, this would, might be like a, tier one or, or tier two or a tier three. Um, the question in the second paragraph primarily serves two. So this is a purpose function. It's a pretty small one because it's just a few lines that might be a two. And let's go ahead and annotate lines 13 to 14 so we remember to stop and look at it. Sorry, 13 to 17. Um, so it's starting here, 13 through 17. 
Okay, then we have a word in context for number 45. So if you remember, these are a tier 1, and we are looking at uh, induced in line 16. Okay, and then we have a COE. It's a standalone, but that's still a tier 1. Okay, now we have an inference. The passage suggests, and it is a COE follow-up, so that's another tier 1 and another tier 1 together. 49 is a word in context, so this word, um, dramatic, in line 62. So that is a tier one, and then look, we come into all these graph questions. So um, according to the table, so that's going to be a tier one. As presented in the table, that's going to be a tier one. Um, day in the table, most directly support which claim from the passage. So if it's a graph and passage together, we often call those a wild card, but this is also a COE, so probably it would still be a tier one. So if you're a jet courting, Almost everything in this passage is a tier one except the first two. So that's going to be really helpful. Um, let's go ahead and start reading. We're going to do this in just the standard format. I just wanted y'all to see how the um, eject chord process might work on this passage. Okay. So many millennia before the invention of herbicides, farmers simply plowed their fields to control weeds. Even today, plowing can constitute a valuable part of integrated weed management. Although plowing kills st uh, standing weeds, farmers have long known that it often leads to emergence of new weed seedlings in a few weeks. Ecologists have shown that a farmer's field can have 50,000 more, uh, 50,000 or more weed seeds per square meter buried beneath the surface. Um, plant physiologists have shown that seeds buried more than about one centimeter below the soil do not receive enough light to germinate. Do the blades of a plow, which can reach more than a foot beneath the soil surface, bring some of those buried seeds to the surface where they germ where germination is induced by exposure to light? Okay, so it states that if they're even a centimeter below the surface, they don't get enough light. But then there's this question of, does the plow bring them to enough light to where germination or growth is induced? Um, so I see this word induced as like started, or it's like ask, acting as like a catalyst. Um, two ecologists, Sauer and Sturick, began to study this question in the 60s. Simple experiment, they went to 10 different habitats in Wisconsin during the night, collected pairs of soil samples. Start up the soil in one sample of each pair in the light and start up the other sample of each pair in the dark. Then exposed all 10 pairs to natural light in a greenhouse. For nine of the 10 pairs of soil samples, weed growth was greater and the sample stirred up in the light. So if it was stirred up in the dark, it was there were less weeds grew. They concluded that the soil disturbance gives weeds a light break and this stimulates their germination. So just digging those, those seeds up in daylight condition exposes them to light for long enough that the weed seeds start germinating. Most recently, Hartman of Erlanger University in Germany reasoned that when farmers plowed their fields during the day, the buried weed seeds are briefly exposed to sunlight as the soil is turned over, and that stimulates their germination. Although light exposure from plowing may be less than one millisecond, that is enough to in induce the germination. Uh, so this it would be minimized if farmers just plowed at night when the photon influence um, is lower. So although even under these conditions, hundreds of millions of photons strike each square millimeter of ground each second, it is below the threshold needed to germinate um, the seed. So at night, if you plow at night, the seeds are not receiving enough daylight to germinate. Hartman says this was very, he was very skeptical when he first came up with this idea because he assumed that it was basically it was too simple of an idea. Uh, it would, must be ineffective or everyone would be doing it already. But the subsequent experiments first presented in 89, um, uh, clearly demonstrated that these methods are effective. He tested this idea by plowing two strips near uh, this area in Germany. He cultivated one strip, repeated three times at around midday, and the other strip at night. No crops were planted in these pilot experiments to avoid possible competition with the emerging weeds. Okay, so that is like kind of a control. The results were dramatic. More than 80% of the surface of the field plowed was covered by weeds. Okay, so 80%, that is dramatic. Uh, that's also like statistically significant, or it's like a huge, a huge showing. 
uh, whereas only about 2% of the fields plot plowed at night were covered by weeds. So 80% during the day versus 2% at night. That's a big difference. This method of weed control is currently being used by several farmers in Germany um, because many of these weed species invade other areas as well. Um, this method could be helpful elsewhere. Studies at universities in Nebraska, Oregon, Minnesota, and all these other places support this idea. Okay, so according to the passage, exposure to light. We know this answer is going to be before line 13. So let's go back and look at exposure to light before line 13. Okay. Many millennia before the invention of herbicides, they plowed, integrated weed management, although plowing kills staining weeds. Farmers have known that it often leads to emergence of new weed seedlings in a few weeks. Farmers field can have 50,000 more um, buried beneath the surface. Plant uh, physiologists have shown that weeds buried more than about one centimeter do not uh, receive enough light to germinate. Um, so do the... Uh, does bring them up to light and plowing induce germination. Okay, so let's look. So exposure to light allows seeds to, all right, so it's, it talked about inducing germination, so that looks good. They don't absorb nutrients through the sun. They do that through the soil and their roots. There's nothing about temperatures in here. And then we don't know what maximum growth is. This is just like the catalyst or the start of their process. So it has to be e, uh, A. Um, okay, question the second paragraph, line 13 through 17. This is talking about the plow churning up a foot below, and does that bring it to the surface enough to induce germination? So emphasize the uh, provisional nature of the findings. Note, because we're not at the findings yet. Introduce the specific research topic addressed in the passage, maybe. Suggest the hypothetical impact of the studies analyzed in the passage. So this wouldn't necessarily be the impact of the studies. It's, it's just kind of the impact of the sun on, of the light on uh, this crop. Indicate the level of disagreement. No, there's no disagreement. So we're just introducing the specific research topic. Does plowing expose the seeds to enough light to germinate growth? Or to begin germination. All right, so as used in line 16, the word induced, we kind of started that talked about that being like the starting process or the catalyst. Um, so it wouldn't be lured. They're not sneaking things in or trying to get attention. Um, established, that's not quite, but let's hold on to it. It's not convinced. The light is not convincing the seeds to grow. It's acting as a catalyst. It's the stimuli that creates that, that causes that growth. So it is stimulated, not established. Okay, so we have an evidence, an evidence question that's a standalone, and we're looking for the choice that supports the idea that seeds present in the fields plowed at night are exposed to some amount of light. So even if it's at night, some amount of light is there. So we're looking at seeds present in fields plowed at night. That at night has to be present. So 31 through 36. More recently, um, these guys in Germany reason that when farmers plow their fields during the day, the buried weed seeds are briefly exposed to the sunlight as the soil is turned over, and that stimulates their germination. Okay, it can't be that because that is about daytime, so we will get rid of A. 36 through 38. Although the light exposure from plowing may be less than one millisecond, that can be enough to induce germination. So again, that is during the day, so we can get rid of B. 43 through 47, although even under these conditions, hundreds of millions of photons strike each square millimeter of ground each second. So we have to know what these conditions are um, before we can figure out what it is. So um, let's go back up to just before that. So we ended here. Thus, if the germination of weed seeds would be minimized if farmers simply plowed their fields during the night when the photon influence rate hits the surface. Um, so although even under these conditions, so this would be at night. So C is a very distinct possibility. So let's hold on to that. Make sure anytime you see words like these or it or they, you're going back to see what they are referencing. All right, 48 through 52. Hartman says that he was very skeptical 
uh, when he first came up with this idea because he assumed that such a simple method of weed control as plowing at nighttime would be ineffective or it would have been discovered long ago. So that does talk about at night, but let's see what the original question was wondering. Um, what happens to seeds present in fields that are plowed at night? Okay, so it's not, or um, not what happens to them, I'm sorry. Uh, what proves that they are exposed to some amount of light? So there is no discussion of light in D, so it has to be C. It, and it's that detail about how many photons are still hitting the surface. All right. So now we were on to a COE pair. The passage suggests that if um, Seidel had planted wheat or corn on the two agricultural strips in Hartman's experiment, the percentage of the surface of each strip covered with the weeds would likely have been. So all of this is to say... If he had planted other crops, wheat or corn, what would have happened? Okay, so how would wheat or corn being planted on those fields have affected the outcome? So 56 through 60, Hartman tested his idea by plowing two agricultural strips near this area in Germany. Um, the farmer cultivated one strip, repeated threefold at around midday, and the other strip at night. Okay, so that doesn't talk about wheat or corn or other crops. We can get rid of that one. B, 60 through 62. Okay, no crops were planted in the field to avoid possible competition with the emerging weeds. Okay, so this idea of possible competition, we even made a note that this was the control. If corn or wheat had been planted, they may have competed with the existing seeds. So let's hold on to B. And then C is line 62. 62 says the reality or the results were dramatic. Okay, that doesn't talk about the other crops. It just talks about the results of the existing experiment, which would did not involve other crops. So we would get rid of this one. Get rid of that one. That is a, a check mark of possibility. And then D 63 through 66. Um more than 80% um, versus the 2%. So again, this is the results of the existing experiment, which did not have any other crops. So our answer choice is B. The other crops might compete with the weeds. So going back to 47, um, the weeds would likely have been lower than what he had found. Okay, so that's possible because that would um, kind of go out, go with the idea of competition. If they were competing against corn, there would be more corn and wheat and therefore fewer weeds. Higher than the percentage that Hartman had predicted? No, because they're not going to overtake all of the corn or wheat, so we'll get rid of B. Nearly impossible for him to determine. I mean, if that was the, his control, then he had a pretty good idea what was going to go on. Comparable to the original projection? No, because they would be competing, and so that competition would lower the percentage of the weeds found. Okay, number 49, the word dramatic. We talked about this as being like um, statistically significant. We have this idea of 80% versus 2%. And so they were not dramatic in a theater sense. We can get rid of that one. It can't be sudden because we don't know how quick the way, how quickly the weeds came up. We just know that they, it was a large number difference. Um, so impressive is a good option. I don't know that weeds could be emotional or that our response to data about weeds can be emotional. So let's go with impressive. And now we are on to the graphs. According to the table, in which soil sample distributed in darkness did the fewest number of seedlings emerge? Okay, so we need darkness, so we're in this one, and we need the fewest. So it looks like the fewest is zero, and that's deciduous, deciduous wood, which is sample A. And then, as presented in the table, which samples produce the most in light? So we're in the other column, and we're looking for the biggest number. So now we're in light, and we need the biggest number, which is this 14, the muck field, which is I. Be very careful on things like this, because they gave us an I and a J, and those are very similar looking. So if you are not doing a good job of following your numbers across, that could ruin your answering pretty easily. Okay, so now the data presented in the table most directly support which claim in the passage. 
So overall, the, the data suggests that uh, seedlings and soil distributed in the darkness are significantly lower than those distributed or disturbed in light. So we need a line of evidence that shows that wheat, that plowing at night is going to lower your weed count. All right, lines one through three. Many millennia before the invention of herbicides, farmers simply plowed their fields to control weeds. Okay, that doesn't really give us the result of night versus day. It just says that this has been a process that's been going on for a millennia. 8 through 10, ecologists have shown that a farmer's field can have 50,000 or more weeds per square meter buried beneath the soil surface. Okay, so again, that doesn't say anything about light versus dark. It just says that weeds are a big problem. Uh, 10 through 13, Uh, plant physiologists have shown that seeds buried more than about one centimeter below the soil surface do not receive enough light to germinate. Okay, so that is how they exist in the dark, but there's not a dark versus light, and there's nothing about plowing, and the, uh, the table is about plowing. So let's take a look at this last one, 38 through 43. Thus, okay, therefore, we got some results. The germination of weed seeds would be minimized if farmers simply plowed their fields during night when the photon in, uh, photon fluence rate um, is lower. Okay, so yes, if you do it at night, the chance of weeds is lessened. So the evidence that we are looking for is D. And that's it. That's the entire reading portion.